Morning, James. Uh, thank you for your invitation and introduction. Um, so I've got a brief bio of you here. So obviously you've had a, a long experience working in the Japanese market. I think we're going to structure this morning. If you don't mind, we'd sort of just have a look at why you might want to invest in Japan for income and, and how you actually go about selecting Japanese income stocks. So over to you for a bit. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we are trying to, uh, I suppose, fight a perception that Japan is not a good place to invest for the long term. Um, although I think uh, there are a lot of very, very favorable characteristics of, of individual companies. And, and secondly, that. Um, trying to identify the best opportunities and the overall opportunity to invest for, for income in, in Japan. And the chart that you're showing there really is the chart that, that it really initiated my interest um, in looking for, for companies in this particular manner in, in Japan. Uh, very, very uh, notable and, and stark difference between uh, corporate behavior with regard to, to debt in Japan and the US over the last few years. Um, which is uh, very interesting given the low interest rate environment that Japan has um, been in for, for quite a long period of time. Um, but if you look at the, the second, uh, sorry, the, the chart on slide three, um, the, the analysis that we undertook following that chart was really just to look at sort of corporate cash flow in Japan and how companies have been using that. Uh, the chart here has two lines. The first, uh, the, the yellow line is corporate cash flow and the darker line is, is uh, corporate cash flow spent or, or, or CapEx. And you can see that there's this very, very close correlation between those two lines for an extended period, which, what, which is nearer that I think people look back as the economic miracle of Japan, even through the bubble um, period of the, of the 80s and the last decade of the 90s. Um, companies effectively spent all the cash flow that they had generated. And it wasn't until um, early part of uh, the current century, so 99, 2000, that corporate behavior changed quite notably. Uh, and we can see that both from this chart and from the previous one, that in that uh, net debt um, peaked around that time. Um, and also, you can see here from the, the, the divergence between these two lines that corporate uh, ca cash flow or uh, how companies utilize their cash flow changed quite dramatically. Um, we, we can look back and identify this as being quite a sort of traumatic time for the corporate world in Japan. There was notable bankruptcies, uh, nationalization of the banks, really the legacy of, of the bubble period. So really from then on, we, we believe that Japanese companies um, have been uh, addressing or redressing the problems that have been created by, by the bubble period and that period of overinvestment. Um, Companies started to pay down debt, as we have already identified. They were using cash flow to write off impaired assets that had been created by the, the asset bubble. Um, but also, if you look at the, uh, the next slide, you can see that a portion of this now surplus cash flow started to come back to shareholders in the form of dividends and share buybacks. And that was something that we found particularly interesting. Um, initially, uh, if we go back to those early years, it was a time when Japanese equities were trading at uh, very significant premium to the international peer group. And it wasn't really until to the period 2010, 2011, after the uh, financial crisis that we were able to look at stocks in Japan whose valuations for the first time in, in a very, very long time were comparable, if not cheaper actually in many cases to the international peer group. And it was really that uh, valuation opportunity and the uh, confidence we had when we were meeting companies that this more favorable approach to shareholders um, would, was entrenched, was becoming entrenched, that gave us uh, the opportunity to investigate this particular strategy much, much further. Um, and I think one, one thing that has been very, very notable um, since that period has been greater political support uh, for this um, as a concept. Uh, former Prime Minister Abe, uh, who uh, announced his so Abenomics reform and restructuring program in 2013 incorporated a very, very important component in the third arrow, which was looking to improve uh, capital efficiency, looking to improve corporate governance and ultimately shareholder return. And that certainly has been a strong driver of this over the last few years. Um, and one thing that we are particularly encouraged by is the performance and the delivery of shareholder returns during the last 18 months where 
uh, dividends and uh, have been under pressure in other parts of the world. We believe that we can demonstrate that dividends in Japan have been much, much more robust. Um, and very encouragingly, as we now sort of come out of this period, uh, we are seeing some very significant uh, uh, uptake again and uh, growth of dividends. Um, and that's highlighted, sorry, on, on slide five, just to, just to sort of complete that, that short set um, of, of uh, slides. Um, here we have dividend growth um, of major markets. And this is a chart that quite often surprises um, a lot of investors that actually um, over the last few years, Japan has uh, delivered much, uh, a much superior dividend growth profile than the international peer group. Yeah, that's very interesting, actually. In terms of tonight, dividend payout ratios, are they still down below where we would be, for example? Uh, yeah, yes, they are. Um, it's still an evolving um, trend and an evolving uh, concept in Japan. If we look at it from a dividend payout ratio perspective on slide eight, we can see the payout ratios in Japan are... Uh, lower than, than other international markets. We can look at, we could uh, look at it uh, from the alternative angle and say that dividend cover has been much, much higher. Um, and this is for the fiscal year. Uh, this is for 20, this data is actually for 2020. Uh, we don't have the full data yet for, for 21, um, but you can see with higher dividend cover, there's a very, there was a very strong support for the stability of dividends during that particular year in comparison to, to many of these other markets, particularly, particularly those in Europe. Yeah, I skipped over this one. So th yeah. actually, I mean, this is quite remarkable in terms of the, the income resilience. Um, only 3% of the companies canceling their dividend. Were they companies that were just being overcautious or were there some that were just forced to? Uh, certainly a com combination of both. There are certain parts of the economy that got hit harder than others, um, as we've seen in, in, in other markets as well, areas like leisure, um, travel, etc. areas got hit particularly hard. And I suppose in those circumstances, it's, it's understandable that those companies um, were forced to make some very, very tough decisions. Um, but, but overall, um, you know, the data is, is quite compelling. Dividends, I think, have been very, very robust. There are one or two examples of companies that, that we're aware of that maybe uh, well, that, that did cut their dividend, in some cases by only very trivial amounts. Um, and actually, it's quite an interesting point of discussion when we meet those companies, given that many of those have very, very strong balance sheets, have very good cash flow as to whether or not they feel it was appropriate to have cut the dividends or whether or, whether or not it's part of the learning process that we feel um, is taking place in Japan at the moment. So if it happens again, whether or not companies will, will be much more committed, those particular and relatively small group of companies will be committed to those dividends and, and maintain those going forward. We obviously had the situation where the banks were, were forced to cut dividends in um, UK and other places. Was that true of Japan as well? Actually, that, that's a very good point, actually, because the situation for the banking industry is, is quite a lot, has been quite a lot different. Um, it, part of the reason for that is that um, the, the, um, the capital that Japanese banks raised after the uh, uh, Lehman crisis was directly from shareholders um, rather than um, uh, you know, governments, as we've seen in other parts of the world. So they're, they're immediate. Uh, responsibilities were, were towards their shareholders and as a result of that the dividend profile of banks has actually been well, much better than robust actually because they've continued to grow those dividends uh, fairly consistently actually over the last two or three years and the yields that we see I think are, are, are very very appealing. Cool okay um, here we are just said here this sort of companies with net cash now this is a thing that I suppose that we've been talking talking about a bit here at Quoted Data because we've got um, AVI Japan Opportunity is one of our clients and um, yes. it's obviously targeting a lot of these companies that have got excess cash on the balance sheet but this is really quite extraordinary in terms of the, the amount. Yes it is yeah I mean we, we have seen um, a, a greater distribution of, of, of cash and cash flow to, to shareholders as you identified on one of the uh, earlier slides. But despite that, actually, if you look at the, the total amount of cash on balance sheet 
and uh, the number of companies with cash on their balance sheet, those have increased since 2000 um, and 2013, let's say, when uh, we really started focusing on, on this strategy. So uh, it does highlight the fact that maybe the potential now is, is even better than it was when um, in, in those early stages. Um, the improvements, I think, that the, the, the need for improvement has, has been highlighted by um, Abenomics, this focus on, on improving capital efficiency and obviously holding cash at um, you know, zero interest rates on the balance sheet is, is very inefficient. Um, so, and companies are becoming aware of that. Um, so they are being encouraged in, in some, um, some ways through the corporate governance code itself. So for example, reducing cross shareholdings, uh, they're being encouraged by initiatives like the um, uh, re um, reconstitution of the of the major indices in Japan, which will take place in a couple of months' time at the beginning beginning of April, um, and requirements for, for each uh, level of index do focus on on areas like capital efficiency, um, and also to some extent pressurised as well by by external investors. Um, Activist is, 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 is one word. Um, I think generally um, a, lo a lot of the uh, investors that we are aware of, and we would certainly put ourselves to some extent in, in, in this category, is that we are aiming to encourage um, and educate a lot of these companies to, to improve their overall corporate governance. You actually have this question here already. Do, do you have a, any kind of overlap, do you think, between the sort of stocks you look at and the ones that are in the activist funds? Um, I think there are actually, when, when, when I look at the holdings and I've seen recent announcements from um, companies or, or, or the uh, investors themselves, there, are, there is, there is a, a, a small overlap. I mean, our general approach, I think, looks for companies, maybe, maybe starting point is, is, is similar, um, but we are looking in general for companies that we believe already have this willingness to um, deliver more to shareholders. So we're not trying to force them to do that. Uh, we certainly, as I mentioned, um, keen, keen to encourage companies to do that and to continue to do that. Um, but we, we focus really on, on companies where we believe sort of management is very, very high quality, understands these concepts. And we can demonstrate from um, history, as, you, as you've shown here with one, one of the examples um, in, in the presentation of a company that is already delivering to shareholders in a way that investors in, in other markets are very, very familiar, and that's through dividends and, and maybe also share buybacks. So what makes a good company in your eyes? Um, we, we look for some of the characteristics that we've, we've outlined already. So companies that do have very, very strong balance sheet. We want companies, and this is very, very important, that, that, that can grow. Uh, we are not looking just for sort of pure uh, deep, deep value. We want companies that as businesses can grow. We, we want companies that can generate the cash flow to reinvest in their business uh, to capture that growth. Um, but companies that have surplus cash flow, um, operating cash flow or cash flow on their balance sheet, that they can distribute to shareholders in an appropriate manner, and ideally in a very, very stable and uh, consistent manner. And it's, it's interesting, so this, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, is it Tochi or to that's, that's it, yep. yeah. Correct. <laughs> the, so the payout ratio doesn't seem to be rising here. Is that something you, you'd expect it to do over time? Um, yeah, c companies are actually, um, and uh, you know, Itachi is, is a very good example of it, sort of steadily increasing um, the, their aggregate payout. So um, the focus for, for many companies is the, is the absolute return, which is a notable change um, from where we were in Japan to 10 years or more, or more ago, where companies did have payout targets, but they applied that with a great deal of discipline, which meant that as dividends, sorry, as, as earnings rose, dividends went up, but also as earnings fell, dividends got cut. And we've moved away from that, or many companies have moved away from that mentality. And they're now focusing more on stability, which is very important. Um, so as in the case of Itachu, you can see the dividend has been increased uh, consistently in, in each year and it's doing that in I think in a fairly sort of mindful way um, in that it doesn't want to risk having to cut the dividend so rather than seeing a, a specific uh, payout ratio each and every year we're seeing a, a, you know some degree of variance in that but what a company like Itachu has done has raised 
what it will be, its aggregate payout over time. So its average payout over time. Um, previously, that was around about 20%. That's been increased towards 30%. And we're seeing similar moves by, by other companies as well. In some cases, those figures are much higher. So companies may be moving from 30% towards sort of 40, 50, and in some cases, 60% of ag aggregate payout. Um, so we, we think the underlying trend um, is, is, is notable um, and it's positive. Now, this is thing, so small companies. So, so in terms of the things you look at, what's the kind of market cap range of things that you look at? Uh, we, we feel there are opportunities right across the market, spec, uh, market cap spectrum in Japan. Uh, we, we highlight two examples here um, of being very high quality companies with good market share in, in their particular field. Shoei on the, on the right hand side um, is uh, a leading, in fact, the leading manufacturer of premium motorcycle helmets. Um, around the world. Um, it's a small company in Japan, but you can see from that uh, historical track record uh, that we demonstrate here with the dividend, it's been a company that's been growing uh, consistently. It's a company that's done very well throughout the uh, period of pandemic. There's been a greater demand for, uh, for uh, individual um, mobility rather than uh, maybe using public transport, and they, they've seen a notable benefit of that. Um, it's a company that has a very, very strong balance sheet, very good market share, um, in a number of regions of the world and has been continuing to grow consistently and shareholders of that company um, have benefited from, from that, um, both in terms of capital appreciation of, of the shares, but also in terms of this um, attractive rise of, of dividend. Um, that's uh, um, one example. Um, a second here is, is Carter Holdings. This is obviously not, not, not necessarily a uh, quite the same profile. It's not uh, a company that's driven by international uh, growth opportunities in the case of Shoei, but it's a company that's very dominant in the domestic market, domestic Japanese market in what it does. It's um, an, an online um, advertising platform um, that is very closely related to Dentsu, which is the largest marketing organization in Japan. And what is interesting in this particular case, and I think interesting maybe for people sort of look, looking at Japan, is that the number of investment opportunities we are identifying is increasing, increasing um, quite notably, and in part due to some of the changes that, um, that are taking place. And in the case of Carter Holdings, this requirement um, of the new TSE uh, uh, sections, the uh, uh, prime listing uh, was, was a particular target, and they required uh, a more a broader uh, investor base, they required uh, greater liquidity in the shares, they required um, uh, greater measures of, of, of capital efficiency and the consequence of, of that was a notable change in, in uh, management uh, approach to distribution of dividends. Um, they introduced a, a DOE target, a dividend on, on equity target of 5%, which uh, ensures I think a greater degree of stability than maybe a tying it directly to earnings yeah. and we can see what that has meant in terms of the dividends uh, over the last two, two or three years. Um, so that's something that's very, very exciting uh, for, for us to be able to invest in very, very strong growth uh, profile uh, historically and, I, and we believe uh, that will continue going forward. That's interesting, the online ad growth. I mean, one of the things that we, we picked up again from working with other clients is that in some ways Japan is kind of backward in the way that um, it's been adopting things that we take for granted, like online shopping and online advertising and payments and things like that. Is that something you, you've noticed too? Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, Japan is, is very advanced in some areas and um, you know, a bit behind Western economies and others and embracing sort of online technologies um, uh, is one area where it is very clear that, that Japan um, has lagged the rest of the world. Um, as a society, it's very uh, historically been very cash based um, and there's been a, a reluctance to use um, you know, electronic settlement, etc. But there, there are trends definitely that are observable um, and we are seeing uh, areas like this where Japan is catching up pretty, pretty rapidly with its neighbours. Here's some things that you, you wouldn't buy, presumably. Yeah, I mean, they, they, these are quite interesting examples because they are sectors that have actually performed uh, reason, well, very well, actually, in the case of 2021. Um, but we are disciplined and focused in the way that we approach 
um, our holdings. We, we, we aim to be sort of long-term investors, identify opportunities that, that, that have long-term duration. Um, and these are very good examples of areas that don't really offer us the, the opportunity that, that, that we seek. Um, we understand certainly why uh, steel sector and the shipping sector, Kawasaki Kisen is a, a one of the leading shipping companies, um, may have performed well in the short term. And as we can see here from the, uh, from the charts, that that is generating a certain degree of return um, through dividends for, for shareholders this year. But we fear um, if we look back historically and also just from our contact with, with these companies and their peers, that actually the dividends that they are producing this year could just as easily disappear to nothing again next year. And that wouldn't suit the, the profile of, of this particular strategy. Yeah. Um, questions, there's a please somebody started out there, but there's just questions we've got. Um, let's do one just on big picture of Japan. So what we've seen recently is a few changes of prime minister in quite a short order. Is that something of a concern? Um, yeah, it does return us to sort of the pre-Abe uh, period where there did, I don't think was a prime minister who, who, who survived uh, even 12 months. Um, so um, it does run the risk of maybe um, political, more political instability. However, um, you know, greater detail or greater analysis of, of the Japanese political um, environment, I think just gives us slightly more encouragement in that these are prime ministers coming from effectively the same political party. Um, and as a result of that, uh, we haven't really seen any material change in overall government policy through the last few years. Abenomics was, was introduced um, in, in 2013. And on the whole, I think within Japan, it seemed to have, have generated some fairly uh, positive uh, benefits. Um, our belief was that when Prime Minister Abe re retired, which he did in um, 2020, there would be very little change of policy. There's a lot of support for what he's doing or what he introduced from um, po politicians from um, um, uh, you know, bu bureaucrats, corporate leaders, etc., and, and generally the, the population. So I think uh, if you look at the policies of Sugasan, who replaced Abe, they were pretty much the same, and the same has been true um, so far with, with Kishida San, who, who, who's the current prime minister. We think that the, the, the um, general direction is, is positive, and particularly in, the, in this regard, shareholder return, corporate governance, capital efficiency, I think there's a general belief that this, this will is beneficial to, to Japan as a whole. I don't know if you look at it this way, but, but how much of the portfolio is kind of domestic Japan and how much of it is exports and things? Yeah, currently actually when we, when we, when we look at this, we're around about 50-50 in terms of revenues. Um, so 50% of the revenues are ge generated domestically, 50% are in, in aggregate overseas. There, are, there is some exposure we have that is um, solely uh, domestic. We have a, a couple of uh, real, real estate investment trusts, uh, logistics and infrastructure that are 100% domestic. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, companies that have very little percentage of their earnings coming from uh, from the domestic market, Shoei being a good example, actually, it has um, less than 5% of its revenues coming from the domestic market e exports from Japan to um, uh, over 80 countries uh, internationally. And um, it, it has a very, very different earnings profile, uh, 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 sales profile. What's the sort of um, COVID experience been like? Is the market, is the economy kind of recovered from COVID now? Um, again, that's, that's it's a very, it was some very, very interesting observations. I and mean, Japan coped very well in the initial um, phase of the pandemic. It was very early to close its borders, uh, shut its schools. Um, but there are certain characteristics we've seen over the last last two years that do, do well, tell us maybe a lot about the pandemic and, and a lot about the management of the pandemic. Um, so currently, as we speak, Japan is actually experiencing, I think it's, I think it calls it its sixth sort of quasi state of emergency um, with certain restrictions um, advised. So the, the, the overall um, profile of, of, of the restrictions is, is very different, maybe from, from the ones that we've experienced here, here in the UK. Um, it's basically a request from the government for 
um, bars and restaurants, for example, to close early, a request uh, for people not to travel if they don't have to, um, and that, that's still having an impact on the economy. So if you look, if you look at the components of the economy, generally um, things are performing uh, very well, um, exports, uh, manufacturing, etc. cetera, um, although there is still the uh, sort of leisure component and face-to-face and -face meeting, face-to-face -face travel um, that, that is still somewhat sluggish. I think we have a, a, a you know, belief from observation of behavior during periods where there haven't been any restrictions in Japan, that as we've seen elsewhere in the world, there is a desire for, for the population to get back to sort of pre-pandemic uh, behavior. So I think that's, that's quite encouraging for maybe the second half of the year, or, or maybe, maybe, more, uh, maybe even sooner than that, um, as the restrictions are, are, are lifted. Um. One of the stocks somebody's picked up that, that you hold, I think, is SoftBank, um, which has obviously uh, been a rather interesting story recently. Can you tell us a bit about what why you hold that one? Is that actually some, some you used to actually hold? Um, yeah, actually, um, just, as a, just to sort of clarify, the company that we own is SoftBank Corp, um, which, and, which is the telecom, um, uh, predominantly the telecom business of the broader SoftBank group, which is the one that tends to generate all the headlines. Um, so it's a slightly different, um, well, it's a very different company really from the, uh, the, the one that owns Arm, um, et cetera. So um, this, this company is uh, a, a very uh, um, a dominant player in the, the, in the domestic uh, mobile handset uh, market. It also has some very attractive sort of growth uh, opportunities that um, uh, include Line, which is a um, so social media network that's very, very popular in Japan. It also um, is a very significant stakeholder in PayPay, Pay, which is the um, uh, electronic uh, settlement, uh, the leading electronic settlement business um, in Japan. So uh, just, um, I suppose to make clear, it is very, very different in, in profile to um, the, the SoftBank Group, which is a, an, an, an effectively an investment fund. Um, SoftBank Corp has a very strong balance sheet. It has very secure cash flow from its mobile business. It has some fantastic growth opportunities with some of the initiatives that, that, that I've mentioned. And also it has a very, very different shareholder return profile. SoftBank Group um, that doesn't necessarily aim to return uh, to, to shareholders in, in the short term, whereas uh, SoftBank Corp has a very defined dividend policy, which currently sees it have a, have a yield of, of almost 6%. What's the kind of turnover like on your portfolios? Um, in, in general, we believe it's, it's relatively low. If we look back historically, it's been around about 20%, so in, indicating a, whole, a holding period for around about five years. Um, and that's really the, 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 uh, the level we would expect, I think, go, going forward. Um, it, was, it was slightly higher during, during uh, 2020. Um, that was a direct response, obviously, to the, to the changes and the challenges of, of the pandemic. But in general, we, we believe that if we can identify companies that have the profile that we're looking for and can continue to, to um, improve their shareholder return, then, then we will be rewarded for, for buying and holding those. I don't know if you've got an idea of what sort of the, the excess cash, if you like, on the balance sheets of the companies that you hold is, but um, I was just kind of linking it. Is, could you actually see maybe companies doing one-off big special dividends or, or big tenders and then a sort of more normal progressive dividend policy afterwards? Um, yes, there are certain examples of, of companies announcing special dividends. Actually, in Japan, there's quite often companies pay commemorative dividends, so you know, 100 years since it was founded or when it moves up to TSE 1, for example, companies often pay commemorative dividends. Um, but I would say that in uh, the, the more sort of common way of one-off distribution is through share buybacks. Uh, most companies include that um, and the, they're taking a fairly pragmatic approach and, and a flexible approach to, to buying back shares. Um, companies do certainly do pay the occasional special dividend, but they tend to be quite small. So the commemorative dividends are usually quite small in, in comparison to the, to the existing dividend. Um, and any flexibility really we, we see through share buybacks. Um, how much sort of engagement do you do um, um, with the companies that you're investing in? 
Yeah, we, we, we have an enormous amount of uh, opportunity to meet um, uh, to meet company and company management. Um, we are a team of, of um, based in London, but we have regular contact. Uh, pre pre pandemic, that that included um, you know visits to Japan on a very very regular basis. So that's three or four times each a year for members of the team. Um, and we spend a lot of time with with management, understanding their sort of motivation, their understanding of of improved corporate governance and looking um, where possible to try and improve that and, and educate companies um, in, in doing that. And I would say, as just, just from a sort of experience point of view, the best way we have found to do that is just to, to demonstrate to, to the um, management of one particular company, maybe another company in the same sector, particularly a domestic company that is doing something that we feel more appropriate. Um, and uh, we feel that that has very significant impact. How much money actually are you running in this style? Uh, well, we, ha we have um, uh, two vehicles, an open-ended and uh, a closed-end vehicle. The, the, uh, the closed-end has a uh, market cap of, of over 200 million sterling, and the open-ended fund is around about 250 million sterling. Okay. And is it something you'd like to grow? Uh, very much so. Yes, definitely. It's, uh, we think it's a very, very exciting opportunity. I think income is is very important to investors, and maybe more so given um, the likely path of, of interest rates and, 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 and inflation. Um, and I think Japan offers a, a very, very attractive uh, gr growth profile fr from here in this particular respect. With the trust, what sort of revenue reserves it got? Um, we have, uh, well, the, the board of the trust have, have, have considered that a very, very important uh, component over, over the last few years um, and have built up a, a revenue reserve of around about 1.8p currently, um, which I think is uh, equivalent to almost 50, uh, yeah, almost 50 percent of, of the current dividend. Cool. OK, so I think that probably answers some of your question here about the durability of the dividend. Um, And do you use gearing on the trust? We do actually. Yes, we have a what, what, what is a structural geared position. We have a we, we at all times have a twenty percent gearing, um, and the reasons for that in the short in the shorter term were obviously we believe that income is one of the um, uh, competitive um, advantages we we have for this particular trust and competitive differences, and that structural twenty percent gearing boosts the income generating capacity of the trust. Um, to allow us to, 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 to deliver a, a, a strong and favourable income profile. Um, but also when we looked at this from a longer term perspective, when we do look at it from a long term perspective, we believe that there is a very strong argument for maintaining that over the long term, because if we look back historically, companies, um, e even in Japan, that have delivered consistent and uh, progressive dividend growth uh, over long periods of time have also delivered strong capital growth and so that's even true in, in, in the market of Japan where historically where we can look back historically and say well the index hasn't gone very um, you know, made much progress however indiv individual companies have and a fairly common characteristic of those companies is, is that they have treated shareholders on a on a, an appropriate basis on a consistent basis o over time so we, we feel that that kind of hearing offers uh, a boost to, to the income generating capacity, but also uh, will benefit shareholders in, in the long run through capital appreciation as well. Um, the, the trust has subscription shares. What are the mechanics of those? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, the subscription shares were, were issued last year, really um, by the board um, in response to the, the the wide discount that emerged during the uh, initial phases of the pandemic. And they are there from a long term perspective to, uh, to, to hopefully sort of boost the, uh, to, to, to um, enable the, the board to achieve their goal of, of growing the size of the trust for the, for the benefits, obviously, that, that that delivers in terms of sort of lower average uh, costs and also for in, improving the, the, the liquidity of the trust. Um, they were issued on the basis of uh, one subscription share for every five uh, shares held, 
uh, with an exercise price of uh, 161 uh, ex exercisable um, every quarter um, from February last year. Okay, so that's one way of, of growing the trust potentially. Yes, um, that's right. But, but obviously the, the discount narrowing, um, if you get that on the premium and consistently, that's going to help too. Um, yes. Okay, good. Can I, I think maybe probably the best thing is just to like sort of wrap up. I mean, in the current market environment, we, we were talking about this earlier on in the show, like with a bit of inflation, you haven't seen inflation in Japan. Do you, do you think that the, the Japan and Japanese economy is changing? Is it, is it evolving now? Um, it, it, it is, yeah. I mean, Japan, Japan is, is a, a, an economy and a, a culture that, that changes and embraces certain uh, uh, ex, external influences. Um, and and, and that, that continues un, un, undoubtedly. There are certainly challenges within Japan. Uh, obviously, the demographic profile is, is, is well known, and that sort of creates certain challenges for individual companies, individual sectors. But we, we, you know, we feel that investing in Japan doesn't really necessarily have to really expose an investor to some of those, those challenges. Um, where we are um, focused really, I think, are, 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 is in areas where uh, the companies have very, very strong uh, international presence and, and, and can grow as a result of that. Maybe companies who, who have very strong presence just in the re just in the Asian region. So companies that are well regarded within Japan, we find are also well regarded across uh, across the Asian region, um, and are using that to to uh, to grow specifically amongst its um, near neighbours, where obviously population dynamics are, are very very different. And also, as you alluded to earlier, actually there are areas in Japan um, in the economy. Um, that are changing and that creates uh, as many growth opportunities as it does challenges for, for incumbent companies. So we, we find there are a, a lot of very, very interesting uh, ways to invest in Japan without really having too much exposure to the problematic areas that, that, that people uh, know of in, in, in that particular country. Is there more corporate governance reform to come or are we done with that thing? No, I think um, it, certainly the... Um, the sort of groundbreaking uh, announcements of the introduction of stewardship code, corporate governance code, um, were as far back as 2014-2015, and as a result, it's it. You know, maybe the fear is that, that, that that's it, and that nothing further happens. But actually, I think we've seen very clearly that those um, those pressures on, on companies are continuing. Uh, the corporate governance code, stewardship code, certain criteria of those um, are reviewed every, every few years, and we've seen a further tightening of, of, of that. Um, I mentioned the the, um, the the TSE becoming more involved, the Tokyo Stock Exchange, and and, re, and the reconstitution of the indices that is bringing uh, certain pressures. We've mentioned the the external pressures, which ultimately may may, may have the the greatest impact. Um, you know, the, the impact of, of, of um, external shareholders. So we, we feel that uh, corporate governance is still very much at the forefront. It might be easy to forget about it because there are other themes that people talk about, be it um, you know, either economic recovery or renewable energy or um, you know, digital transformation. Um, the, the, these, are, these are interesting areas, but we, we feel that you know, the most significant for investors uh, over the long run is this goal to improve capital efficiency, improve general general levels of corporate governance, um, and ultimately to improve the returns to shareholders. And that will flow through into dividends and um, help your funds, which is good. Yes. So thanks very much, uh, Richard. I think it's very really interesting, actually. Um, right. Thank you very much, James. It's a bit different you. when we come to Japan. Um, and actually, even in Asia, it, did, you know, it sort of stands out as just something that's unique. Um, so good luck with it, and um, we'll we'll follow your progress and maybe talk to you again another time. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everybody for your questions, um, and we'll be back next week uh, talking to uh, Carlos Hardenberg, who's the manager of Mobius Investment Trust, um, and um, see what they have to say. They've always been performing quite well, and um, helped by the sustainability angle, I think. Um, and then, as you know, we've got our Around the World series coming up.
and also Master Investor in the offing too. So um, I will see you next week. Thanks very much for tuning in today.